So morning, Keith. Welcome. Thank you again for joining me. Uh, the Climate Action for Associations. I'm Ali Heppenstall and we're doing a series of interviews, uh, critical conversations, we're calling them, as part of London Climate Action Week. I'm going to give you a quick introduction, Keith, if that's all right. So this is Keith Warren, Chief Executive of the Food Service Equipment Association, the largest independent food service equipment association in the UK representing more than 190 companies across a huge range of product areas, including, and, and I'm sure you'll expand on this in our conversation, Keith, but beverage, cooking and warming, food waste, refrigeration, fabrication and manufacturing, ventilation, uh, 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 dealing with fats and oils and greases, etc. And obviously, because of all of that, sort of a great uh, I guess a, a, a big link, your members play a big part of the supply chain, uh, all in the uh, food and uh, beverage uh, industry. Um, I guess I kind of like to start Keith, by asking you, um, so what's the link? Tell us about the link between FEA and climate and action. For those that are listening that might not necessarily get the what the um, FEA does mm -hmm. and who your members are and what role they play in this much bigger sort of mm -hmm. climate emergency that we're facing. Yeah. Um, thanks, Ali. Yeah, and uh, great to be with you this morning. It, essentially, what our members do is provide the equipment that facilitates the food and the drink that we eat out of home whether that's something we choose to do or something we have to do, whether in hospital or, you know, grabbing a coffee on the way to um, a, a meeting. And as a result of that, the, the work that we do is significant, both within um, Europe and within the UK, in looking at the whole issue of, of climate change and uh, the, the agenda that's being set for us. Um, and we're a very fragmented industry, and that's one of the challenges, fragmented in terms of the, the, the customer base for our members, fragmented in terms of the supply chain that uh, feeds into that, um, and equipment is, is part of that fragmented supply chain, hence the, the number of members that we have providing lots of individual items of equipment, all which come together as a system. So we, we've seen the climate change agenda come to fruition through I work within Europe through our European Federation. Um, and I think what's increasing is the focus on the, the organisational responsibilities that, that we, we have to undertake. And that's really where our journey has started with, with CAFA in terms of what, yeah. what we're doing for our own representation. But uh, yeah, it, it's net zero carbon by 2050. And for us, we're only three kitchens away from that, given the average commercial kitchen will last 10 years. Uh, Lots got to happen very quickly. Yeah, talk us through that, Keith. What do you mean by we're only three kitchens away from net zero by 2050? Mm -hmm. Well, um, for us, as I say, the, the average lifetime of an operator kitchen, kitchen is about 10 years and pretty much the average life cycle of equipment is um, seven to 10 years because these are big capital items of equipment that get repaired and refurbished and indeed reused. Um, so... We're, we're three cycles away from needing to be at that net zero carbon target. And of course, every day that passes, it becomes more difficult to achieve that end game for the industry. So we've got a strong policy agenda we're putting forward that we think government should adopt to facilitate and enable that. Yeah. And you I mean, it's, it's not fair to say that you're, on one hand, you're quite early in your journey in terms of internally, what you're doing corporately, um, but you know, this is something that you've had your your eye on and very very close watch on for quite some time, isn't it? As an association. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say we've been very active in the agenda on behalf of our members in representing mm -hmm. the, the climate change position, and we've got a a circular economy principle white paper that we published eight years ago, um, yeah. which says what our members should be doing. I think it's fair to say what we haven't been doing as an organisation is looking internally at what we need to do to actually meet that challenge ourselves. And so that, that journey has started fairly recently. And indeed, just this week, uh, we had a board meeting that we approved the, um, the, the opening work that we're going to be doing to look internally at what we do, how we operate and, and ask those challenging questions um, mm -hmm. to, to bring about the change for the organisation itself. It's not fair that we should be talking to our members about their journey. 
without addressing the journey that we need to be on as their trade association as well. Yeah, a climate action for associations, we, we, we call it get your own house in order, yeah, uh, yeah. as well as support mm. the membership that you represent mm. uh, to drive change as well. So in terms of if we can split our conversation into two, in terms of what you, the next steps for you internally, mm. what is it? What is it that you are planning to do that you've already you've obviously started to engage with key uh, uh, stakeholders, board, council, etc.? What's your what's your next steps? Do you think just so for those that are listening in who haven't actually started their journey yet, okay. what um, what do you suggest? Well, I'd commend uh, any chief exec or managing director of a trade association to look at the resources that are there, because mm -hmm. in starting we knew we needed to start the journey. Until I became aware of CAFA, it was a challenge of where do we start, and I guess it was going on the too difficult list for a while. Um, mm -hmm actually seeing the resources that are available in, was a great enabler to actually starting to enable us to start putting our strategies together. Um, and what we've done is taken those resources and looked at the areas of activity where they're relevant. And I've given those to the individual staff members to say, take a look at that, look at where we are now and where we think we want to get to. And what are the stage goals that we can put in place to achieve that? So yeah. I'm trying to get the team to address it and feed up rather than it be a top down approach of, you know, dictating we're going to do X, Y or Z. Yeah. I'd sooner have the participation. And that's that brings some interesting challenges in there. And the one we had just recently, as far as events, and we have a, a big annual conference in September, we usually um, produce quite a lot of paperwork because we think that gives a comfort factor to all the delegates. And I'm brutal, yeah. if I'm brutally honest, a lot of that will go in the, the bin at the end of the day. So we're now looking at how do you address having a conference without a delegate pack? And that brings the challenge, well, we need a delegate pack because we print A4 pages which support those who are sponsors. So it's like, okay, how can we deliver that level of communication but without using a physical presence? So these are the sorts of debates and discussions and we think we found a way through it. That are, yeah. that are challenging, but actually it's been quite unifying as a team in terms of how we look to, to, to manage those situations. Yeah, and it's, it just picks up on a conversation that I had yesterday around exactly the same thing. And at CAFA were producing some guidance around what alternatives you could use at events to mm -hmm. um, printing reams and reams of collateral. And there's a lot of technology out there now, including yeah. QR, scanning codes etc which obviously supports member engagement as well yeah. because then you have that uh, ongoing conversation mm -hmm. around the subject matter in which they're um, trying to access the information on which is obviously mm -hmm. um, really interesting to partners and sponsors mm -hmm. as well so we can we can pick up on that mm -hmm. conversation uh, when we produce the guidance uh, later in July um, but I think you touched on a really good point about the fact that uh, it's it's totally integrated so mm. the to be sustainable and to run a sustainable uh and uh, energy efficient association isn't just something that you sort of bolt on the yeah. side it, it it increasingly has to become a part of the fabric of the not just the operations but the mindset yeah. and employee yeah. culture and values as well um have you, how big is your your internal sort of steering group that you've pulled together or your, not steering group, your, your operations group in yeah. relation to? Well, as, as a team, there are four of us and we're also supported by external services and such things as, as PR and marketing yeah. communications and, uh, and technical work as well. Um, and actually that it was the CAFA resource and, and looking at that supply chain of who we use um that that led me to talk to our pr company and i said okay where are you on the sustainability agenda because it's one of the selection criteria that could be used um yeah. and this was a facet of their work we weren't aware of and he said well apart from the fact that the company car is electric apart from the fact i've got solar panels feeding into the, the business and so on and so there's a whole ream of work that was already going on there which is great because we can capitalize on that and use it to present back to the members saying you know, the journey has already started and we can bring up up to speed where we are. So as well as looking at where we go, it was capturing what we already got and how we yeah. can use that proactively within the organisation. Um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it, it, 
it gives a fresh approach to what we do. And I think that's the value. And I think for, for a chief executive of an organization, and uh, we all tend to have enough other things to do. And this is a critical factor that the resources realize that we're not on our own trying to reinvent what it means for us. We've got those resources there. It's how we adapt what's there and use them. And some of the elements are, you know, 100% aligned we can do. Others think that's not quite for us. So that, that selection of what's relevant means that uh, we're, we're not wasting any resource in trying to manage a, a campaign to become, you know, carbon efficient within the organisation. Yeah, yeah. And your own internal, Jenny, are you feeling that that's, that's something that will start to ramp up quite quickly over the next year or so? And do you think you'll, you'll achieve some significant results by 2030? Um, without any question, we will. Um, what's just happened this week, uh, I mentioned about the conference in September. Part of that conference was already focused on net zero carbon, more from the members, but we're going to interject a piece into that, which is about what we're doing as, a, as right. the organisation. And yes, we've got some quick wins in there and then the medium and long term plans. And obviously the, the longer term plan is the 2030 and being you know, totally carbon neutral. Um, mm -hmm. We've got a, a scheme in place with um, an organisation called Trees for Cities, talking about offsetting carbon. And we're principally using that for members to offset their carbon uh, against that programme of effectively us trying to plant a forest for our sector of the industry. Um, but as a collective, that's a, a bigger picture piece of work. But uh, what we want to do over time is offset the, the Food Service Equipment Association's carbon by being part of that and what we contribute back from, from our work. Fantastic. And with just a couple more minutes left for our conversation, if we just sort of flip it back round to member support, what's, what, what are the next steps in terms of the, you talked about your policy uh, agenda and the pressure that you're putting on government, et cetera. Can you just expand a little bit more on what your next steps in relation to that look like and um, what we expect to see coming out of the FEA in the not too distant future? Yeah, okay. Um, we aware of the COP26 uh, meeting later on this year, we had a focal point uh, uh, against that. And also recognizing the challenges of what we've just been through with, with COVID. Um, so we put a five point plan together uh, and just to very briefly um, give a, a view of that, it's that members who are producing more energy efficient equipment should get uh, a value back against that for bringing it to market. Yes, there are existing, existing R&D and uh, tax credit schemes, but there should be an enhancement for new product that's coming on that's more efficient than old product. Um, for consultants and um, dealers who design the, the kitchens, there should be points for in installing that equipment. And there are schemes around that collect that, but they're not as focused as they need to be on our particular sector for, for equipment. So we want greater recognition there through the, um, the, the schemes that are in place. And then for the resellers of equipment, and we work heavily, our sector works heavily through the, a dealer network, that the, the salesperson or the business who's selling that more energy efficient piece of equipment should get a cash incentive at the point of sale. Not at the end of the year with a claim back, but within days of that having been made, um, because we're trying to hold the supply chain together. And I mentioned fragmentation at the start. It's that fragmentation that dilutes a lot of the effect that could otherwise take place. And then going through to the operator, um, and it's great that the super deduction is there, the 130% uh, uh, capital allowance that, that's available for operators. But of course, it does mean that if they have to be making a profit to gain that, and within food service at the moment, given that the industry is, uh, has been heavily shut down and restricted over the last 15 months. That's a challenge. So we're saying there should be um, a deduction that could be made off business rates, for example. So it's more directly uh, relevant to their business, the fact they're buying this energy efficient equipment. And then to bring all of that together, we need a proactive recycling scheme that takes old, perhaps less efficient equipment out of the market, refurbishes it, repairs it, reuses it, redistributes it, um, perhaps internationally, where others can take advantage of it. So we're, we've got a churn going on within the market, and that's very much the policy position that we're pushing forward, because all of this issue is going to need some radical thinking from government to make a change. 
um, the, the um, evolutionary movement from where we've been to hope to hope that we get somewhere by 20, 30, 40, and 50, it's not going to happen. Um, and other things that could come onto that agenda are the greater leasing of equipment for a period of time so that, that old equipment becomes obsolete from a capital point of view and new, more energy efficient equipment can go in. Um, should energy companies be in charge with doing this? They supply us with the energy. They've got to reduce the carbon footprint of the energy supply networks. There are different issues that can come through there. So there's a lot of big discussions that are going on at the moment to, to help uh, facilitate the change that's going to happen. And how likely, I mean, you, you used a great uh, statement there around government needing to, to think more uh, laterally and ambitiously. Yeah. Um, you, on your sense, is there, are, are we moving in that direction? Is that, is that something that you've, you've actually seen evidence of recently? We have. Um, certainly the investment is there. And uh, let's take a very big picture uh, piece, the move towards hydrogen as a gas supply. Our sector uses a lot of gas um, at, the, at the point of use to, to heat food products. Uh, the move to hydrogen will remove the carbon from that and, and we're fully behind that. So that's pretty radical and it's, it's against that decentralization, digitalization and decarbonization agenda it's going on. That started a while back, but what we've seen more recently, um, a big move from government towards having an effective energy technology list as a procurement portal that customers can use to select equipment based on its energy efficiency. It'll bring a challenge as to how that equipment is judged and the standards that are needed, but they're out there uh, and they, they're what need to be incorporated in that so that those value judgments can be made against either an energy label or an energy using criteria. So there's yeah. some, some bigger picture things going on yeah. that we'll see come through and there's some more localized work. And I have to say uh, the Department of Business Bays is doing a lot of work on this to facilitate it and they, they get it and the resourcing is there and the caliber of the individuals is strong. And uh, I think what we just need to see is a, a more um, criteria based policy agenda from government, because as soon as that is there, then companies will move to fill the gap because they have the certainty of what the future looks like. At the moment, I think it's still, um, it, it's still not as clear as it could be. Yeah, fantastic. Keith, we're nearly out of time. Thank you so much Pleasure. for joining us. Uh, Keith Warren, the Chief Exec from the FEA. Keith, um, parting comment uh, to an association, perhaps not even in your industry, who perhaps might not have even started their journey yet. Have you got one sort of tip that you might be able to offer anyone listening in that, uh, that is looking for some sound advice? Um, yeah, I think in terms of association development, I, the value for money, I'm brutally honest, of signing up to CAFA and getting yeah. access to those resources saved a, a significant amount of, amount of time on that. In terms of the other aspect for, for the members, I think it's really get as close as you can to the, the government officials who are leading this work as a partnership because they're great on policy, but what they don't always have is the, the, the detail that we have within trade organisations. And I know, you know, many of us as part of the day job are very close to that, but I think it's to get even closer to them on behalf of the members and help formulate the policy to make their job easier. If we do that, we'll get what our members need in whatever sector of the market and industry we're in. Fantastic. Great finish, Keith. Thank you so much for joining us and um, we'll speak to you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, Alison. Take All care. the best. Bye. Bye. Bye.